Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. We've got the uh, uh, we've got the notorious Kevin Mitnick here. He's going to talk to <laughs> us a little bit about uh, data privacy and his new book. So uh, today is the day for the release of this new book. It's uh, been about five years since he wrote Ghost in the Wires, My uh, Adventures as the World's Most Famous Hacker. Another excellent read, by the way, if you have a moment to read it, if you haven't already. Um, Qualls is extremely pleased to bring you back again. Uh, for the release of this new book, it's been five years. So five years, you know, exactly. Exactly. Uh, what's been? Uh, that Ghost in the Wires was released here? in 2011, right? Yeah. So, uh, so we released uh, <coughs> Art of Invisibility today. I'd like to introduce my co-author, Rob Vermosi. Raise your hand. He did uh, a lot of the heavy lifting here, and without him, this book would not be possible. So, thank you, Rob. Okay. So, uh, so. Uh, been about it's been about five years Correct. and uh, uh, you know you were one of the most uh, wanted uh, talk a little bit about uh, your history and, and background as being one of the most wanted hackers uh, for hacking over 40 companies just for fun sure I started I started hacking actually for my love of magic as a young boy I was fascinated with magic and I'd ride my bicycle to the local magic shop so I could learn all the tr the secrets to the tricks that the salespeople were doing uh, when they're trying to sell the magic illusions. And I just loved this as a kid. And when I went to high school, I met this kid who could do magic with the telephone system. He was involved in what they called phone freaking, which is the pre predecessor to computer hacking. And I was just taken aback and I wanted to learn all the tricks this kid could do. And also I was a prankster. I love pulling pranks. And one of my favorite things to do when I involved myself in phone freaking was to change my friend's home phone to a payphone through the phone company computer system. So whenever his parents try to make a call, it'd say, please deposit 25 cents. So I really got involved in the phone freaking side of things and exploring the phone network. Same thing with Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak. They were actually back five years earlier building the blue box that was in the 1971 Esquire. It was detailed in the 1971 issue of Esquire magazine. And what, if you don't know what a blue box is, it emits multi-frequency tones. So you can control the uh, uh, out of bands. Uh, I'm sorry. You could control the signaling of the PSTN, the public switch telephone network, to do things like call people you aren't supposed to be able to reach, like the Pope, and that sort of thing. So when I got to high school, and I was involved in this phone freaking, I met this other kid who said, "Hey, you might want to take a computer class since you're in interested in this phone stuff." And at the time, I had no interest. I was interested in amateur radio and phone freaking, that was it. But the kid introduced me to this, the computer science instructor, and he asked me, he goes, what prerequisites do you have? Do you have uh, calculus? Do you have physics? Uh, what year are you? And at the time I was a junior, I didn't have the prerequisites. So my friend said, show the teacher what you could do with the phone. So within two minutes, I had his unlisted phone number. I showed how I could reroute the modem number in the school lab and all these sorts of tricks. And he said, hey, I'm re waiving the prerequisites. You can come in the class. And I'm sure he regrets that decision today. So the first programming assignment he gave the class was to write a Fortran program to find the first 100 Fibonacci numbers. And at the time, I thought that was quite boring. And I never wrote a piece of code in my life. And I go, in my, in my mind's eye, I'm thinking, I've got to come up with something cooler. So I decided I'd write a program to steal the teacher's password. Let me give you the setup. Back in those days, because I'm older, we had all of Eddie 110 baud terminals. We had acoustic coupler modems. We put the hand, we dialed the school system's net, uh, PDP 11. We put the ha handset into the acoustic coupler modem, and we would type hello to log in, put in our credentials. We type bye to log out. But nobody would ever disconnect the phone. They just always leave it in. So I came up with the idea that I could just write a simple program in Fortran that would simulate the operating system, basically the login sequence, and fool the teacher into giving up his credentials, and it worked like a charm, right? So he comes around into class, and he's walking by each desk. People are handing in their uh, Fibonacci assignment, and he comes up to me. I have nothing. And he goes, where's your work? I said, I didn't get a chance to do it. I was doing something else. He goes, I stuck my neck out, let you into class, and you're not even doing the work. I said, I wrote a cooler program. He goes, what? I go, isn't your password Johnco? J-O-H-N-C-O? He goes, how'd you get my password? And I said, well, I wrote this program to steal it. 
And this guy just got a big smile on his face. He goes, wow, this is so cool. He puts it up on the board, shows all the other students. So that was the ethics taught to young Kevin Mitnick in the 1970s. It's cool to hack. There you go. <laughs> so, so, so during all this hacking, the last five years, what have you been up to? Well, pretty much uh, I, I still hack. Um, I run a company that we do penetration testing. So companies from around the world hire us to break in, you know, physically, technically, using social engineering, which is one of my favorite techniques, uh, testing SCADA systems, just pretty much looking for methodologies, practicing tradecraft to bypass security controls. That way the client could obviously shore up their defenses. So we, you know, we uh, do simulated hacking, which I'm sure other vendors in this big hall do as well. Like, I, I could point out three of them. So in your book, you talk about your success rate and the fact that uh, you're able to get in 100% of the time. Is, so is that accurate? I almost lost that record on this last pen test for this client, but we finally did it. Is when it because this is the fifth year in a row testing that particular client. Whenever a client allows us to use social engineering and scope of a pen test, our success rate, success rate is 100%. Uh, it's getting harder with one particular client because every year we, we compromise them, they get better. So it's, I'm worried in the next two or three tests, I might lose that record. So um, talk. what was your favorite hack that you ever did? My favorite hack. Who's read my book, Ghosts in the Wires? Anybody? Well, my favorite hack, hands down, was into McDonald's. And it wasn't for a free Big Mac, I promise you. Remember I mentioned earlier I was into amateur radio. Well, what I figured out as a 13-year-old is how to take up the McDonald's drive-up windows. So when p customers would drive up, they'd get me sitting across the street on my radio and said the guy inside the McDonald's on his headset. So you can imagine at 13 years old how much fun you could have. So people would drive up. I'd go ahead and, oh, may I take your order, please? Welcome to McDonald's. They'd give me their order. Oh, you're the 50th customer. Please drive forward. Your order's absolutely free. <laughs> then people would drive up. I could see the occupants clearly. And they would drive up. They'd pl place their typical orders of quarter pounders, Big Macs, fries, Cokes, apple pies. And I could see they're overweight. I shouldn't talk. And then I'd say, Based on the make and model of your car and the weight of the car and the weight of the uh, occupants, we actually recommend you change your order to the mixed salad. <laughs> My favorite was when the cops would drive up. Hide the cocaine! Hide the cocaine! <laughs> so the manager of this particular McDonald's in L.A. runs out of the store. He's looking around in the parking lot to see who's tampering with the system. Doesn't see anything. He walks up to the drive-up window speaker, bends down, peers inside as if somebody's hiding in a speaker. And of course, I key down my ha amateur radar. I go, what the hell are you looking at? And this guy flies back about 10 feet. So hands down, that was my favorite hack in the McDonald's. Yeah. That's interesting. But, so well, yeah, that's what you do at 16 years old, 13, 14, 15, 16 years old, you know. So. so getting back a little bit to the book, the book focuses a lot on data privacy and the importance of, of privacy to individuals. Um, can you talk a little bit about some of the impacts that these lessons of these lessons that apply to organizations and some of the things that uh, we as security professionals need to be considering as we protect customers' data? Right, because I look at privacy and security as uh, very, very commonly related. And like stories in the book, are like uh, for example, exploiting printer firmware, um, getting access to credentials of people that don't use two-factor authentication. Um, one of my favorites is one that HD Moore did, and this is five years ago, where through H323 protocol, he found that a lot of conference rooms, especially for law firms, were pretty much open up to the world. No credentials needed, nothing of that sort. And then you could use, uh, you know, uh, you could focus camera, for example. And one, I think, report was, uh, was able to see the company's uh, Wi-Fi credentials and that sort of thing. So. I see that um, a lot of the issues, because this book is ma mainly a consumer book for people that are not technically astute, right? And the book, it really focuses on that demographic, but it definitely is applicable to the organization because when I'm gonna hack into your, as a target, like in a pen test, the first thing myself and my team does is information reconnaissance especially when we have social engineering in scope. And what we try to do is breach the privacy of the individual employee to get enough information that we could leverage to compromise the company. 
to convince that employee that we're somebody that we're not, to convince that employee to do something, click a hyperlink, open up an attachment, give us information over the phone, uh, simply open up a go to meeting link, something like this, and then we basically are able to compromise them by getting to, pretty much by violating their privacy. Another thing is attackers don't go by the rules, right? So if we want to attack an organization, do we necessarily go right after the core of that organization? Not necessarily. What we'll do is we'll identify employees or contractors that work for the target and compromise them directly, especially if they're in a BYOD environment, compromise their home network, which is going to be a lot easier than the corporate network, compromise their machine, whether it's Windows or OS X, then when they bring that machine into the work environment, we're in with them. So, um, so hopefully that answers. Absolutely, your question. Um, and you know, the importance of people's privacy today. I think a lot of us take it for granted. I know, being in the information security space, I even frequently relinquish information and rights on things like Facebook and other other things. Can you talk a little bit about why data privacy and your and your privacy is so important? And I know in the book you you get to the a lot of points about why uh, individuals shouldn't relinquish that data. Right. Well, I believe in, in my own in my own uh, my own mind's eye. I believe privacy is an inherent, inherent right that we all deserve. That we should all respect. Um, I believe if we know that some third party is monitoring our behavior, our behavior, we actually change our behavior, right? And I think once we give up the right to privacy, we never ever get it back. And I think the revelations of Edward Snowden of how the U.S. government was, you know, is, still currently is, basically they have intercepts on everything and they're using computers to basically analyze those intercepts to see if you are doing any behavior that they might be interested in. Well, I don't like that personally because I feel that's you know, basically violating my personal privacy. I understand why they're doing it, but I think what I think what's going to happen is the government's not going to change. U.S. government's not going to change. Any of the other foreign entities are not going to change either. So we have to take privacy into our own hands, use encryption whenever we can to protect our own data and the data of our clients. That the government is not going to stop. And I don't think we all have to be concerned about government per se, but really about your true adversaries who want to break into your organization and steal your data of your clients, your customer list, your client's data, your client's credit cards, and that sort of thing. Yeah. So, uh, yeah I'm not sure. I'm coming through out there. There it goes. Uh, it sounds like my mic has died out for, for a personal second. privacy in a moment. Well, that's what I was going to ask you, yes. actually. I was going to say, I, I remember reading an article in Forbes magazine that uh, you said you could steal uh, any person's identity in under three minutes. Is pretty it much. really that easy? Yeah, pretty much all your data out there, uh, every credit bureau, TransUnion, Equifax, TransUnion, has all your data. And they basically sell this data to third-party information brokers. And they get it through other uh, means as well. And People can get access to these databases. Some organizations require you to go through a vetting process, but in a lot of cases, they're interested in just having you as a subscriber to earn revenue rather than vetting your true identity. So I'd like to get a volunteer over 21 years of age. There we go. See, that's a clue. Even seeing Switch some of these desktops, Excellent. right, and you can see the docking, the, the, the dock bar, you actually now know what apps I'm running. So. If you know what apps the target is running, that helps you in doing what we call a client-side attack via social engineering. So short of staying inside and uh, cutting all of our power and turning off and locking all of our doors, what else can we do to be to, to protect ourselves against these well, things? I believe in you know encryption, right? And deploying encryption properly. Hopefully, there's some vendors in here that do that process well, because when we're doing security assessments, for example, we find that keys, even to banks, are stored in flat text files on servers and in stored procedures, not using HSMs and that sort of thing. And the first thing an attacker is going to go after, usually when they're attacking your business, is your client data, right? Especially card data, right? And I see a lot of companies, they, they follow PC, uh, PCI DSS and they have uh, the card tables encrypted, right? But the key is right there. You can just steal the key. But what I do is I don't even bother 
what I do is when I'm doing a pen test, I decrypt it right on the server because there are keys right there. And then I exfiltrate the uh, plain text data, right? Because the app has to decrypt it, right? So I'm just like the app, I call the same procedure, I decrypt it, exfiltrate that, done, right? And so I think it's really important to have good policies around how you deploy encryption, how you protect the crypto keys, right? Um, how do employees communicate? I know a lot of companies in New York use those Plantronics headsets, for example, that communicate in the clear. So you know you could buy an eavesdropping device. You know what does it work at 900 megahertz to actually monitor conversations of a lot of some of the Plantronic headsets that all the brokers use in New York. Why isn't there policy requiring requiring the company to use some sort of technology that uses some sort of crypto so those communications are protected? And from a personal perspective, you know, Moxie Marlin Spike's signal protocol, I'm really a true believer in. I had something very interesting happen to me about a couple weeks ago, is I used Signal, and all of a sudden, Signal said, oh, I had to re-register. Because there's a, still a flaw, because Signal depends on the PSTN, because you use your phone number to sign up for the service. So somebody has control over the PSTN, can they be pretend to be you to basically hijack it? They won't get your old text messages, or because they're obviously, you're using, you're the, the key is on the endpoint device. But now it might put them in the position that they can impersonate you until you reset it back to your device, right? Because a lot of solutions, you have to think, who does, what does that solution depend on? Does it depend on the PSTN? If it does, well, read a little bit of my history because that was my main target as a kid, was hacking Ma Bell, right? So if an attacker can get into the SMSC, and get access to text messages that you're using for two-factor authentication, it's still game over. Yeah, I remember reading about some of those stories in your book with uh, messing with the FBI and their text messages. This is some interesting stuff that was uh, Yeah, it was that kind was of in like there. counterintelligence type stuff, but you know, I, I, a lot of people don't, you know, don't think about that. They don't think about, hey, I'm using a technology that depends on the security of the fund company and doesn't realize the phone company could be hacked. Just um, in most recent times, Karsten Knoll, a brilliant researcher from Berlin, Germany, has uh, come out with uh, some vulnerabilities in SS7 that you might want to take a look at. You know, Google Karsten Knoll SS7 because it's some amazing stuff that he's found out that where he could gain access to an SS7 node and do an anytime interrogation, see your physical location, and this sort of thing. So I have a hard time and maybe you should consider this in your policy development, trusting the phone company to make sure, for example, two-factor authentication is going to be secure. Especially as more of us use uh, two-factor authentication over text these days. There's all these, you know, th that's one of the things that, that you can learn from this, from the book, is how, not only how you can protect yourself as an individual, but there's some lessons maybe for you as an organization that you can uh, take back and help your organizations to implement good pra practices and policies. Yeah. You want to talk maybe a little bit about that, and then we'll uh, get in some closing comments, and it'll be about sure. time for us to line share, up. I want to share a story of why, what encouraged me to actually write this book in the first place. I have a real good friend. He's a showrunner for major television shows in Los Angeles. And uh, he, he was dating lots of women and this sort of thing. And, but he was a, a very much into his phone. Every time he's with somebody, he's texting. Every time he's taking photos. His whole life is on his, mobile, on his uh, iOS device. And so he finally met the one in New York at a, at a rap party invited her to move to Los Angeles and decided when the new iPhone came out, oh, I'm going to buy her an iPhone. And just to make it convenient, oh, I'll just share. She can log into my iCloud account, right? So what they did know is now all your past photos, all your past messages are synced, right? So she got a glimpse into all the past relationships. So all of a sudden, he has to get rid of furniture in his house. If he was with the girl on that couch, oh, that goes out. If she, they were eating at this restaurant, Tony Roma's, can't go to Tony Roma's anymore. Right? So, yeah. so I was thinking about how companies like Apple try to make our lives easier by integrating and making interoperability uh, to, make, you know, to make our lives better. At the same time, what you know, don't know is how that affects your privacy. Yeah. So 
All right. Well, thanks for talking to us about all of these important topics. I think uh, you know we're going to get ready here to line everyone up so that they can get a copy of the book and read it for themselves. I read it. It was an, ex it was an extraordinary book. There's a lot of great lessons in there um, across all different aspects of privacy that uh, you can take back and apply both to your, in, in, your, in your daily life as well as considerations when you're advising your companies on how to implement and protect customer data and the importance of their privacy. Right, and don't forget, you want to know your vulnerabilities before the bad guys do. And that's why it's important to have policy. Uh, it, it's important to actually, I think, try to identify your vulnerabilities, whether they're physical, whether they're uh, technical, whether it's social engineering. I was just on a pen test a week ago, and how we're able to compromise that client was all physical. They had biometric card readers, uh, by buttons, seeing biometric devices to get into the facility of the business. So what we're able to do, because they didn't enable the tamper switch, when we were to take the device off the wall, we planted our own hardware, very small piece of hardware in the device that we're able to access over our phones via Wi-Fi and actually do a replay. So when someone used their thumbprint to authenticate, all we were able to do is once somebody had done that, is just replay it. So that's how we were able to get into the business and through other methods, we're able to compromise their complete IT infrastructure. Every, every pretty much, we, uh, it wasn't domain admin, it was all an OSX environment, but basically was able to get to every machine and every critical asset. Just because you didn't have a tamper switch on the biometric device that people were using to authenticate into the company. Yeah. Well, that's amazing. Any closing comments before we get started? No, I, I appreciate everybody coming here. I mean, I, you know, I'm more in the offensive side because, you know, as a young kid, I was doing offensive pen testing for free, got myself into a little bit of hot water, and now I do it for a living. So I'm mostly focused on identifying vulnerabilities for my clients and figuring out how they could better protect their infrastructure. And uh, love public speaking. Uh, Rob, who... Uh, I don't know where he went, uh, over here, who, uh, whose tremendous hard work went into this book, and you'll recognize a lot of the writing from well, the Gadgets book. Yeah, When Gadgets Betray Us, another excellent book. So I'll be happy to sign. I did bring some cool things. I have my, my business card. If, uh, I have one in my pocket. I have them over in my backpack. My business card it actually has utility. It's actually a breakout lock pick set. So if you lock yourself out of your home or office, just think of Kevin Mitnick and I'll open the door for you. So I'll be passing out some of those cards. I have a limited supply when I sign these books. So thank you for coming. All right. Enjoy the book. Thank you.